Good morning. Welcome back to the Outreach of the Heart Ministries. I come to you live from outside Lovell, Wyoming. This is a place where I come once or twice a week. This is the place where I grab sheetrock or wallboard or drywall, whatever you prefer to call it. It's all the same thing. Gypsum board is maybe what some of you older folks may call it. And uh, I arrived here late yesterday afternoon and decided to do something just a little bit different. I'm sitting up in the back of my trailer with uh, the back of the tarp rolled up so that you can see something in the distance. The breeze is, is blowing and it was going to be enough that I wasn't going to be able to be outside. But... I wanted you to have the visual here this morning as well. Um, we are in a desert basin here in west central uh, Wyoming. I believe from what the locals say, they get about six inches of moisture here per year. So very dry, very arid, very much a desert a high desert, they would call it. But I'm sitting down this morning, just going to have a conversation with you. And that conversation is a continuation of what we discussed last week, where I asked you the question, why do you follow Jesus? Why do you follow Jesus? And I asked that very crucial question along with that, is do you follow Jesus because he is your escape route? He is the way to avoid going to hell? Or do you follow Jesus because he is the only way? He is all that you know. You follow him because you want to. You desire to be in a relationship with him. You follow him for many, many reasons. But how deeply do you follow him? That's the next question. So today, the, the title of this message is today is, Why do I follow Jesus? Then the subtitle of that is, This is my story. What's yours? So as I awakened this morning about four in the morning, Lord, what do we do today? You haven't given me anything yet. What? Where are we going with the message today? Well, this is the result of that question. Not to give my so-called testimony, because a testimony is usually a brief story about our life and how Christ has interacted in our life. But he calls me this morning to give you a piece of not just my testimony, but of my life story. So would you join with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to just share, to share the story of my life. Not to point a finger at me or not to give myself credit, but to give you the glory, Lord to give you the glory because of your interaction, your presence in this story, Lord, and how you've carried this humble servant through every day of his life to this point and for the days to come, knowing that you will carry me also. So, Lord, I pray that those who hear this message, that listen to this message, we'll take it to heart. We'll be able to see some of the similarities in their own life and come to know you as their Lord and Savior as a result. Lord, may you receive all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise that is due. And may the peace which transcends all understanding fall upon those who hear this message. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, when the Lord calls you to tell your story. Now, given your testimony is, is fairly simple because it's only going to be 
a five, 10 minute brief explanation, hopefully of what Christ has done in your life, of who you once were, when you accepted Christ and who you are today because of Christ in your life and your relationship with him. But when you're asked to give or you're, you're, you're instructed, not asked, but informed this morning, you will give your story. You will tell your story. But Lord, where do I begin? What things do I include? So you're going to see me looking over here at some notes because there's, there's just some things that the Lord drew into this that I feel he wanted me to make sure that were included in this story. So we start the story this morning with, well, I'm the youngest child of, of three, three children. My brother is five years older than me. My sister is four years older than me. And then I came along. I came along. Um, was born in Nebraska, have lived in Colorado for a short time in my life. But other than, other than that year or year and a half, maybe two years at most, I've lived in Nebraska. The youngest of three children. But as a child, I grew up in a situation that is so common here in America anyway. I don't know about overseas, but here in America, um, adults now telling their stories of having grown up in an abusive home. Well, that is part of my story. But... It's a story that's just a little bit different because there was a reason behind that abuse. And as a child growing up, I used to look at my brother and my sister and, and realize that they weren't being treated the same way that I was, and I just didn't understand it. I thought maybe it was because I was so much younger. Maybe I was doing something wrong. Maybe it was just who I was. But... To make a long story very short, my dad treated me very, very poorly growing up. To the point of when we lived at Jeffrey Lake, south of Brady, Nebraska, I used to love to go fishing. And I tried to spend some time with my dad, so I would go out and go fishing with him. And I had an uncle that lived over in the Gothenburg area, um, an uncle-in-law, actually, would have been my mom's stepbrother. He would come over and go fishing with my dad and I frequently. Well, what I learned at a very young age is if I caught more fish than my dad, I was punished. Punished very harshly with a belt across my behind and verbally and emotionally and just terribly mistreated. If I caught a bigger fish than my dad, the same scenario. And I remember one time I was, gosh, I, I had just as many fish as dad did, but he had, a, he had a bigger one than I did. Uncle Carl, it didn't matter what he caught. Um, dad didn't disrespect him in any way. But I remember catching a big one. I could feel it. Well, I had two scenarios going on. We were, we were coming to the end. We were actually trolling on our way back towards home. And our fishing excursion was about to come to an end. And I caught this fish. And I could tell it was a very large fish. And I'm thinking to myself, if I bring this fish in, I've caught a bigger one than dad, and I've caught more than him. The punishment that I will receive will be double. So I carried a little pocket knife with me just to feel cool, duller than a box of rocks, but I was able to cut my line, and dad saw that. 
the punishment that I received that afternoon for losing his lure and cutting my line is indescribable. So with these stories, I grew up in fear of my dad, in fear of doing something that would trigger him, in fear of doing something that would cause him to take his anger and his frustration or whatever he was dealing with out on me. I grew up in fear. But I also grew up in a, in a state of disrespect. I had no respect for this man whatsoever. He was not a dad to me. He was a threat. And I grew to hate this man. And I've taught my children that hate is a very, very strong word. Hate drives you to do things you wouldn't normally do. It drives you to think things that you normally wouldn't think. To say things that you normally wouldn't say. You see, hatred begins to put you in bondage. You become a slave to that hatred. And as I was growing up in my preteen years, that's where I found myself. Then as I entered into my teen years, the abuse continued to escalate. I remember one morning disobeying my dad and he, he left for work, I thought, and I went out to grab the dog's food dish and bring it back into an enclosed porch that was not heated. And I left the porch door open. The wind was not blowing, there was no danger. And my dad caught me from behind and had me on the ground, beating me profusely with his fists as I lay curled up in a fetal position, taking blow after blow after blow. When he was finally finished, he stood up and he kicked me in the rib cage, knocked the air out of me. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't scream. I couldn't get up. I couldn't do anything but lay there until my air came back. He drove away and went to work. I went to school that morning thinking, oh, hallelujah, finally I'm going to have bruises and marks on me to prove this abuse. I got off the school bus that morning, ran into the junior high locker room as I was a seventh grader at the time, and I stripped to my ankles and there wasn't a mark on me. But why? Why? I don't understand. Well, the day went on that day and I, I went home. Mom was working that night. My brother and sister were not going to be home until late that evening. I was at home alone with my dad. Well, he didn't quite kill me that morning, but I was con convinced that in the absence of the rest of my family, my life was going to end that night. So before he got home from work, I prepared an escape route. I took the outside screen off my window downstairs window in my bedroom. Made sure the window could open wide enough that I could get in and get out and not be trapped in my bedroom. Well, needless to say, I used that escape route that night. I used that escape route that night. And I went up and I sat on a hill in the darkness and waited for the lights of my brother and sister to come home from town. I heard yelling and screaming and slamming of doors and knew it wasn't yet safe. I waited for my mother to get home from work and finally crept my way back down to the house, crawled through the window, and went to sleep. Growing up in fear, of a man who I felt despised me. For some reason, 
some unknown reason. When I came to the age of 14, I decided I'd had enough. I wasn't going to give this man the pleasure of taking my life. I was going to take my own. And I set all the plans for it. I had the barrel of that shotgun up in my mouth and was reaching for the trigger. And the horse that I rode out into the hills on reached over and nudged me on the shoulder and forced that barrel into the back of my throat, causing a reaction, vomited all over that, that barrel, looked at it and said, I'm never putting that in my mouth again. My horse saved my life. My horse, quote unquote, saved my life. I'll come back to that. So I decided, well, I can't take my own life, but I've got to defend my life. So as at the age of 14, I put together this plan. And for two nights in a row, with a large rifle that I had taken out of the gun cabinet, I put my dad in the scope, but had no ammunition in the chamber with which to pull the trigger, for which to pull the trigger. But on the third night, I had one bullet that I had taken, and it was going to go in the chamber. And my dad's life was going to end that third night. But on night number two, when I snuck out of the house to went, go and retrieve this rifle, to put it back underneath my mattress, my dad met me at the back door. At 11 o'clock that night, he had no idea why I had that rifle. But I remember the beating that I took. Indescribable. Indescribable. And some of you may say, well, that was justifiable. You were about to take the man's life. He had no idea what I was planning to do. He just knew that I had his gun. And he nearly beat me to death because of it. You see, I was searching for an escape route. That escape route was going to be taking my own life. And when I couldn't take my own life, because I did try it a couple more times, sitting in my bedroom, but I just couldn't pull the trigger because I didn't want my brother or my sister or my mom to find me. So my next escape route was to take his life. Well, that didn't work either. You see, it brings to mind a, a scripture that I had no idea of at that time. You see, because I wasn't allowed to go to church. My brother and sister were. They were allowed. They could go to youth group and, and participate in church events and so on and so forth, but I was not allowed. I snuck off with mom on occasion, but could not understand what was being spoken of in a in the worship server or in the church service in the sermon the songs were moving but i was in fear of what was going to happen when i got home because i knew the punishment was coming so i never was really able to listen and get a grasp of what christianity is all about but you see there was something that I knew I was lacking. There was something that was greater than I am off in the distance somewhere. But I didn't know who 
and I didn't know what. So in searching for these escape routes, I found that nature was my greatest escape. I remember years before that, I would climb up in a tree and I would stay all day up in the in the upper portions of a tree. I wouldn't come down for lunch. I wouldn't come down for supper. I would go up there in the early morning hours and I would come home, come down in the late hours of darkness. And that was my safe place. That was my escape. That was my place away from dad because I knew he wouldn't come up there because he was afraid of heights. I lived in the nature. I did everything I could to stay away from the house. Unless dad wasn't there. Fear. I lived in fear. I lived in terror. But even more importantly, I lived in the unknowingness of God. I lived in the unknowingness of God. Well, then at the age of 14, later on in the age of 14, mom and dad separated. And the severity of the situation, I was put into a, a safe house. And my mom and I were separated because she went to a safe house as well. And for several months, we lived in these safe houses, separated from each other. And then word came that dad had packed his things and moved on. He was no longer living in, in the town that we were near. And we were allowed then to safely come out of our quote unquote safe houses. Lived in a motel for several months while we looked for a place to live. Finally found a place, an old abandoned farmhouse that hadn't been lived in for Seven or eight years, mouse infested, dirty, but it was a roof over our heads. In the divorce proceedings, they went after my mom. On a financial obligations that my dad skipped away from. That required her to work not just two jobs, but three jobs. She was seldom home. And as I went through high school, I basically lived alone. Mom would come home in the, in the evening hours, late evening hours, and she was gone shortly after I got up and went to school. Saw her very little. I worked also to help put food on the table. Nothing wrong with that. I was doing my part. But once things calmed down a little bit, we got into the sink of life. I began to go to church on my own free will. And I could actually sit and listen to the messages that were being given, but they were cold, they were lifeless, they were dead, they were dry. There was not much encouragement to them. And that people just don't understand me. They just, this isn't, this isn't working for me. I know there's someone out there. I know that there is a higher power. I know someone is in control of all of this around me that created all of this beauty that surrounds me. But in those church services, I never learned that. But I was also attending a, a high school youth group. And I remember the night that our instructor referred to God as Father. And I got up and out of that upstairs classroom. And I ran down the stairs, I ran to my car, and I raced home. If God is like the Father that I know, I want nothing to do with him. And it was during that time that mentors from the church 
adult male mentors came and gathered around me. They brought food. They sat at my, my dining room table with me in the absence of my mother. They brought food. They sat there and they ate it with me. They took turns. Usually there was just one of them there at a time. Sometimes all three men were there. But they took time away from their own families to reach out to this young man who was lost and hurting. And these mentors brought me into the realization that God is not like my earthly dad. They taught me that God is a God of love and that he would do anything and everything for me. but I needed to get to know him. And the only way to know him was through Jesus Christ. So they encouraged me to go back to this youth group. And eventually, at the age of 16, I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. I said, here I am, Lord. I'm yours. And I clung to him like no other because... I could feel his presence. I could feel the love that he had for me. But I could also feel the requirements he had for me. His desire for me to follow his commands, to live and to become like Jesus. But I didn't understand all of that yet. So I went through some growing pains. Lots of growing pains, of trusting and then not trusting, looking for a way of it as an escape, but only to return to Him. But you see, when I gave my life to Christ, I had two really good friends. I had two really good friends at the time, and well, they turned away from Christ, or they they turned a blind eye towards him when I accepted him. They turned to their alcohol and, and sex and all of that. And I refrained from that. And as a result, I lost my two best friends. Who do I have now? I have Jesus. And I knew that back then. Going through the remainder of my high school years, all I had was Jesus. He was in my corner. He was in my life. And I was learning and studying and coming to the knowledge that what pleases God most is for those who call upon His name to learn to live as Christ set forth his example by his life. So I was doing that in, through high school. Sports kind of got in the way, though. Sports became my medicine. Sports became my escape route. Sports became more important than my relationship with Jesus. I was a star on the football team. But my main sport was wrestling because that was just me. I wasn't very team-oriented. I liked my solitude. I liked to be isolated. I liked to be withdrawn. And team sports doesn't allow that. So wrestling was my thing. And as a senior in high school, <clears throat> about halfway through the football season, I blew out my knee running wind sprints at the end of practice. I finished the season setting multiple records within the football program. I could barely walk, let alone run. But the determination of holding on to this escape, escape from reality, escape from the pain of life, drove me through the pain to do what I did. 
wrestling season comes along and I'm determined I'm not going to have surgery on this knee. I'm going to wrestle because I'm going back to state. I'm going to make a name for myself. Something that I can be proud of. Well, the day of the first meet, after going on a crash diet, losing 20 some pounds, 25 pounds to be exact, went from 180 to 155 so I could wrestle the weight that I wanted. I checked in for surgery on my knee and was out for the season. My escape route of sports was now gone. Now what? Now what do I do? I retracted even more into my shell because I took everything that was sports related and just pushed it away. From working in the weight room, trying to set goals, set records in the weight room. I walked away from it all. And walked lost once again. You see, I had let sports overshadow my relationship with Jesus. So now, Lord, how do I come back to you? Well, in the meantime, I was given the opportunity to train a couple of horses myself. And I was working with these horses and working with the spirit of a horse. Rather than break the spirit like I felt mine had been broken, I worked with the spirit of that horse. And upon a voice command or or just a gentle nudge or a lean in the saddle, I could get that horse to do whatever I wanted it to do. Never being disobedient to it, never being disrespectful, but just loving that animal and working with its soul, so to speak. Same way with a couple of dogs. I got the opportunity to train a couple of dogs to retrieve, use them for hunting, hunted off the horse and use the dogs to retrieve, to bring the game back to the horse. It was really neat, great opportunities, but I was so lost. I was so lost. And I became even more isolated and more withdrawn. And after high school, and I go off to college, in this state of withdrawal, this state of isolation, I don't get into the college life at all. That's not my cup of tea but I began to let work become my escape. And I worked and I worked and I worked for one to make ends meet, but because it felt good because it kept me away from reality. Then I ended up getting married, getting married and entered into an unequally yoked situation that God speaks about where one is a Christian and the other is not, and the difficulties that lie within. Yeah, I called myself a Christian, but was I? Was I really following Christ? To some extent I was, but my heart really wasn't in it. My heart wasn't there. I knew he was, but I wasn't. And then my daughter was came along. Uh, this is really going to change things. This is going to be great. I get a chance to be the dad that I never had. And folks, I'm not meaning to disrespect anyone by, by how I speak about them. I know that I'm supposed to build people up, but this is my story. And I'm telling you how things unfolded in my life. My wife, my the daughter of our child, of our little girl. 
took so much control over everything in our life, in our marriage, that I never really got a chance to be a dad. Sure, I would come home from late, work late at night, go take a shower, long to go to bed, and my little girl would be placed in my arms, and we'd fall asleep together in the recliner. That was the only dad that I was able to be. If I took a weekend off, I was so excited. I got to spend some time with my girl, my little girl and my wife in the middle of the day, not so tired, but refreshed and able to do things. And every time I was going to have a time off, my wife took herself and my daughter back home to her parents and they stayed there for the weekend. Never had that chance really to be a dad. And a lot of things unfolded in the in this time period. Trying to figure out how to do this, how to make this work. Determined not to be the dad that I grew up with, but to be a loving, caring, nurturing dad to my daughter. And trying the best to be a husband that treated his wife with respect. And it seemed the more that I tried, the further it drove them away. Well, now we're going to fast forward. I was 30 years old. I was 30 years old, still trying to figure out life. And I knew, once again, that something still was missing in my life. And I was invited to this men's retreat called Walk to Emmaus, which they call a 72-hour short course in Christianity. And the man who invited me told me that I would meet Jesus there. That I would meet Jesus there. I said, I already know Jesus. He says, not the way you should. You know of Jesus. But now you get to know him personally. And I went. And this event transformed my life. On day two of this event, I remember sitting there at this table listening to a speaker talking about God's grace. First time I'd ever heard about grace. And the Lord spoke to me that day and says, Stace, this event is made up of 15 different talks, and five of them are given by clergy, and 10 are given by laity. One day, you will give all 15 of these talks. Meaning that I would one day be clergy. I would one day be a minister. I would be a pastor. And I laughed. I laughed at God. Not me. You can't use me. I'm not qualified. My friends, that was my call to ministry. Very subtle. But very influential. And what did I do? I laughed at God. But he didn't laugh back. He kept working on me, kept working on me, kept working on me. But I began to understand more and more of what grace really is. And that he offered me this gift of grace through my relationship with his son Jesus. And yes, folks, I met Jesus there personally that week, that weekend. I knew that he was real. And I knew that for me to call myself a Christian and not follow him was no different than what the Pharisees were doing. They were religious, but they weren't in a relationship. And that's where I was finding myself. So I studied and I learned and I let God direct me in his grace.
Then a couple of years after that, I come home from work one evening and my wife tells me that uh, she's pregnant and there's something wrong with the pregnancy and she's going to have an abortion. And she's scheduled at this abortion clinic two days later. trying to be the husband and the supporter that I, I knew I'm supposed to be. I had no say in this. She'd already made up her mind. I drove her to the abortion clinic, three and a half hours away. Sat there in the, the waiting room, walked through the picket lines, and felt so filthy, so dirty, so raw, and so judged. And that still affects me this day. But one of the things that I'm not sure of as things unfolded later in life, whether that was my child or someone else's, I don't have an answer to that. So one day when I arrive in heaven, I will have that answer. I may have a little child come running to me and say, Daddy, Daddy. It's okay. It's okay. Well, then, uh, months after that, my son was born. My son was born, and life is complete. I've got a little girl now, nine years older than my son. Life is great. I've got a little boy now. Maybe, maybe I get to be a dad to this little boy and teach him the ways of life. But the same scenario occurred. Limited access to my son. And then that changed. That changed when a young man started coming into my house, our house. And eventually, he no longer came to the house, but my wife went to his. Which allowed me to be the dad that I had been longing for in the absence of their mother. And one night I caught them in the midst of an affair. What do I do? One of the things you learn through grace is the forgiveness of others because that's what grace is about. If we don't forgive others, God will not forgive us. I forgave my wife. I forgave the young man she was with. But then something even more. More came up. You see, that hatred that I had for my dad was still brewing. It wasn't coming out in anger. It wasn't coming out in any type of abuse. But what it was doing was preventing me from loving people, even my children. When God's word tells us that we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, I couldn't love my neighbors because I didn't love myself. I didn't love myself. I hated. I hated and that I was such a captive to that that sin of hatred that it kept me from loving myself and being able to love others. So I went through a process of forgiveness of my dad. I wrote I wrote a letter to him. There's a whole story behind that. I sent this letter asking for forgiveness of myself from him, but also offering him forgiveness. My sister informed me about a month later that I was going to receive two letters, one from my dad and one from my grandmother. And she says, Stace, be prepared. Grandma's letter is nasty. Grandma's letter is nasty. So I took it all in. Later on, I, I received 
the letters. I received the letters on the night that my wife stepped out. She claimed that she had to go to work. She didn't come home that night. As I opened the two letters that she gave me as she walked out the door, and I read them, I found the reason for the mistreatment from my dad. And it was because of a lie that my grandmother had forced upon my dad, saying that I was born out of a sinful relationship with my, that my mother had, that she had cheated on my dad, and that I was born of another relationship with another man. So I was no, I was not his. Well, folks, yes, I am. That was a lie that my grandmother told, and that is a lie that my dad continues to believe today. Part of the story behind all of this is today is Father's Day. And I'm celebrating out here in the middle of, of Wyoming, sitting here talking with you and celebrating this. I'll receive a phone call from both of my children at some point today saying Happy Father's Day and I will be blessed because of it. But folks, there's something that is longing within me and that's to be able to call my dad and say Happy Father's Day. My brother and my sister are able to do that today. But I'm not received. I'm not a part of his life. He has chosen to excommunicate me. Still believing the lie that my grandmother told me. Today's a difficult day. It has been for years and years and years. So today I rejoice in celebrating being a dad to my two children. But I celebrate even more knowing that I am a child of the living God, that he is my father. Well, after the letters, I came home the next night after work to an empty house followed by a divorce. And through that divorce, I finally became the dad to my kids occasionally. But I was able to become their rock upon which they could stand. When the Bible speaks of we are to train up a child in the ways they shall go, that was what I was doing. I was training up the children in the ways that they should go. Did they go the way they should? Not necessarily. But the training was there. But you see, that call to ministry was still knocking on my door. I hadn't yet accepted it. I kept seeking the wisdom of the Lord and saying, Are you sure? Are you sure? You see, I had some health issues and didn't want to enter into pastoral ministry as an escape route from doing physical labor, which I was becoming more and more difficult for me to do. I didn't want to use ministry as an escape route. I wanted it to be of the Lord. So we fast forward. I decided to accept God's call into ministry, but yet didn't take, make any moves towards that other than one. I became aware through scripture that talking about the qualifications of an elder of a church, which the pastor is an elder. He is the lead elder of the church. Must be a husband but of one wife. That Lord, I'm going to be disqualified from the church because I'm divorced. 
that maybe if I get remarried, they'll overlook the divorce. So I ended up getting remarried, thinking that that was, that was a solution for a problem. What it really was, was an escape route. So that I wouldn't have to contend with the denial of a church because of my divorce. They could look just upon the fact that I was married. And that marriage ended three years later because it was for the wrong reasons. And again, it was in an unequally yoked situation. But it ended up not in just because of those reasons. I began to receive death threats from this spouse. You're as good as dead to me with a butcher knife laying on the kitchen counter the next morning. I began to fear for my own life as well as the life of my son. My daughter had already chosen not to participate in the family events, not to come to my house anymore because of this woman living with me as my spouse. I ended up filing for divorce and allowed the, these people to live in my home for four more months, three more months, excuse me, until her son graduated and then I gave them a, a time to be removed and they honored that. What does this all have to do with following Jesus? Well, I'm going to turn the page now. You've heard a portion of this story. But I'm going to fast forward now into becoming a minister, answering that, that call to ministry. I began ministry in a serving three churches as a certified lay minister with a uh, lead pastor over top of me, serving three churches, and the, the two of us worked very well together. And then he got called away, and a replacement came in, who I was more qualified than he was to be the leader of this church, to be the head pastor, but I was not given that opportunity. And then the whole situation with the church denominations deciding whether they wanted to accept sin as, as, as being right and the standing against sin as being wrong. Long story short, I ended up leaving that set of three churches to walk down the street to another church, to a one that I knew also had a false teaching teaching that you're saved through your water baptism, not through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And God called me into that church to grow that church in truth and reveal the false teaching. And it grew. That church grew in number. It grew in their knowledge of Jesus Christ. It grew in the knowledge of the false teaching that was there. And then God said, it's time. And I stepped away from that church, not knowing that two-thirds of the congregation was going to step away that morning also. Then that portion of the congregation asked me to continue to be their minister. So we began to meet elsewhere as a small group. And then COVID came. COVID came along. Shut the doors of that building. And when it was, we were given the okay to begin to meet again, the consensus of those left in that 
body of believers was not to meet anymore. Devastating. God, you called me into ministry, and now you've taken the ministry away. Now fast forward to today. Here I am today in the middle of Wyoming on Father's Day, bearing my heart to you and explaining to you why I follow Jesus. So why do I follow Jesus? Let's get into the scripture. But before we get into the scripture, I want to share with you something that I read earlier this week. And it says this, and I don't know who wrote it, so the author is unknown, but I'm going to use it as a quote. The true Christian hates sin, flees from it, fights against it, considers it his or her greatest plague, resents the burden of his presence, mourns when he or she falls under its influence, and longs to be completely delivered from it. Let me say this all again. The true Christian hates sin, flees from it, fights against it, considers it his or her greatest plague, resents the burden of its presence, mourns when he or she falls under its influence, and longs to be completely delivered from it. My friends, that struck so true to me because that is the very reason I follow Jesus. I follow Jesus because I hate sin. I follow Jesus because I try to flee from it, not as an escape route, but to flee from it personally because I hate sin. I don't want it in my life. And when I see sin in, in the life of other people, it just really, really bothers me. But I know none of us is perfect. I fight against this sin. I consider it my greatest plague. I consider it my greatest plague. I resent the burden of its presence in my life. I mourn when I fall to its influence. I fall under its influence. And I long to be completely delivered from it. Now, folks, I want to go back in the story and say that the night that I wrote that letter to my dad, that was my moment of forgiveness of him. And that forgiveness occurred that night. So I talk about my dad today, not in an attitude of hatred, but in an attitude of love. If he only knew. If he only knew. And in fact, I was informed later on, about a year later, by my sister, that my dad and his new wife had received the Lord. They became Christians. Oh, great, now I can begin a relationship with my dad. And I did. I began to build this relationship with him. All the old things put aside. This was all new. He was a new creation. I'm a new creation. I got to meet him at my sister's wedding for the first time in years. He attended my daughter's wedding. He attended a worship service that I was conducting in the midst of those three churches that I was first serving. Him and his wife were there. They wanted to meet with me afterwards. And I was conducting a, a, a message on the difference between heaven and hell. And they got up partway through the message and walked out. And I've never seen nor heard from them again. They shut the door. I'm not in his will. I'm not a part of his life. I'm nothing to him. But he's forgiven. He's forgiven. So why do I follow Jesus? Turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians. Chapter 4, we, be, we begin in, in verse 17, and it's, 
it's quite a lengthy reading here for us, folks. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the fertility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. We're in Ephesians chapter 4. We're picking up in verse 20 now. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Verse 25, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Verse 29, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Chapter 5, verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather there should be thanksgiving. For... Of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes upon those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them. Verse 8, For you once were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. Be very careful then, in verse 15, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart unto the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, why do I follow Jesus? Because he set forth the example. I desire to please God. I desire to know God's will. And the only way I'm going to please God is to follow his son. The only way I'm going to know God's will is to follow his son. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. This is a gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. I know that Jesus gave his life for me. I know for a fact that Jesus was there that morning when my dad beat me 
nearly to a pulp, and then kicked me in the ribs. I shouldn't have lived that morning. That blow to my rib cage should have broken a rib and could have punctured a lung. And I could have died there as he got up and walked away. But why were there no bruises when I got to the school and looked in the mirror? I'm convinced that Jesus himself laid across my body. And he bears those scars. He bears those scars. Remember back at the beginning of this when I said that my horse saved my life. No, I don't believe my horse did. I know that God used my horse to nudge me on the shoulder to prevent me from pulling the trigger because he had a bigger plan for me and my escape route was not part of that plan. I know that God was there with me as I sat in that waiting room while my wife was receiving an abortion. I know that God was with me when I was receiving those death threats from a second marriage. He was there with me, protecting me and my family. Why do I follow Jesus? Because I know he's there. He's always been there. When I took my dad's wrath because I cut the fishing line when I was eight years old, when I took that wrath, Jesus was there. Why do I follow Jesus? I want to say I follow him because I don't have another choice. Well, I do. I have the same choice as you do. So I'm going to word it this way. I have no excuse not to. I have no excuse not to follow Jesus. But in my heart, I know. I know that I want to follow Jesus with every part of my life, with my full attention, with my full ability, with my greatest desires in mind. And that's to please God. Not to receive some great treasure for my good actions and my good thoughts. But because I know that God has been there for me. And I'm going to be there for God. You see, at the age of 16, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I said, Lord, here I am. And I also used the words, send me. And I didn't understand what those words send me would involve. But here I am today. Because he has sent me. He has sent me. Why else do I follow Jesus? In Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, of which I am no master. No match. I can't stand against these without Christ. Why do I follow Christ? Because I would have no life on this earth without Him. It goes on in verse 13, Therefore put on the full armor of God. If I don't follow God, Christ, I can't put on the full armor of God. I don't even know what it is. But he says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that you, when the day of evil comes, which is upon us, you may be able to take your stand 
and stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And we close with the scripture out of John 14, 6. Jesus answers Thomas, and he says, I, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So today as I've shared my story, it's not about me. It's what following Christ can do in our life knowing that He's always been there, even through the hardest times of your life, whether you've been abused, misused, mistreated, whatever has occurred in your life, I'll guarantee you Jesus was there or it would have been so much worse. He protected you. And He's brought you forth for this day, this day that He has given you. But so many people take this day, just another day on the calendar, for granted. But I follow Jesus because he gives me life. And I celebrate Father's Day today because I know that the Father who created me in my mother's womb gives me the very breath that I breathe today. And I do not take it for granted. And for me to know this God, this Father, I have to know His Son. And not just know of Him, but know Him. And the only way I'm going to know Jesus is by following His example that He sets forth in Scripture. I don't follow Jesus because it's an escape route. An escape from hell. Escape from the reality of this earth. I follow Jesus. Because I want to spend eternity with him. I desire to be there with him. Every step of the way through this life. I desire to give him the glory, the honor, and the praise in all things. I desire to be in a relationship that is pure and true. I desire to be with the one who is the only one that is truly walked with me and talked with me as I walk down this road called life. Others have come and gone, but he is the one that still remains. As hard as I have tried over the years to escape from him, he's been there the moment I turn around to come back. And he says, welcome home, son. Welcome home. And I want to say just one more thing. The greatest abuse that I ever received in my life has come as a result of ministry. Some of the cruelest people are in the churches of today. Mean, vile, vulgar, disrespectful. Ones who claim to follow Jesus. 
but don't even know who he is. So I ask you, why do you follow Jesus? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these words. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to pour out my heart to the people who listen. But thank you even more so, Lord, for always being there, for being the rock upon which I stood. Thank you for the opportunity to allow me to be a dad to two children here on this earth. And to show them the ways they are to go. Even though they've been disobedient on occasion. And one of them is currently living in disobedience to you, Lord. May he not forget what he's been taught. Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.